this morning, I want to talk a little bit about does God hear the prayer of a sinner? Now, we know in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve messed up. They didn't do what God said to do. God said, don't do this certain thing, but they went on and done it. The next thing you know, there's God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. He said, Adam, where are you? And he didn't hear him, didn't want to answer him. God called out, where are you? He said he's hiding in the bushes because he knew he broke God's law. And he knew that there was a certain justice coming with breaking God's law. And today, we have the whole world living like they want to live. They don't want to do nothing that God says to do. Even the people in the churches today, they're living in sin. We got pastors out there that have been divorced multiple times. Women who are upstanding leaders in the churches or have also been divorced multiple times. And they're trying to lead God's people in the right way. You know, I can't do anything about the things that I have already done in my life because that's behind me, that's history. I can't bring back one thing and change one thing. But what I can do is change my future. I can change my future de uh, destination. Now the book of John, chapter 9, asks the same question. I'm thinking, in the Old Testament, one of the guys asked God, he said, how come the heathen seem to have everything? Boy, they got money, they got homes, they got power. They got all these things. And God says, come to my house. And he said in the book of Psalms, and then I went into God's house and I understood. How is it that they're going to have everything now? They're not going to have nothing later on. Verse 31, please read it. I've been telling you all for a while now People who think they are Christians, but are not, they've been deceived into thinking they are by someone, and oftentimes that someone is themselves. Go ahead. Now we know that God hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he heareth. And so what about all these folks in the churches? They're living in sin. doing all sorts of things. And they're praying in their churches. Is God hearing their prayer? According to the Word of God, it says He's not hearing their prayer. But they say, oh, I'm a born-again Christian. But do born-again Christians live in sin? Do born-again Christians live for the world or do they live for the Lord? Most people know if they're right with God. They know if they're doing the right thing. Well, you don't usually have to tell them to do something, do you? Does God hear the prayer of a sinner? Does it just mean an unrepentant sinner? Or does it mean our church is full of hypocrites who say they are Christians and they're constantly living in sin and never trying to better themselves because some pastor says, oh, you'll never cease from sinning. Oh, you'll do that the rest of your life and you'll die as a sinner. But is that a willful sin? You say, well, all sin is willful. Yes, you, you're right, all sin is willful. Unless somebody holds a gun to your head and makes you do something. <laughs> and how many people, okay, have got a gun held to their head saying, okay, I want you to commit adultery with this man's wife. 
I don't see it happening too often. But you know, they're doing it in the churches. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, the Bible says, and you know that song we just sang, she cried holy. I bowed on my knees and cried holy. And he gets to heaven and he lists out a few names of the, some of the people that he wants to see when he gets to heaven. And all along I thought one of them people would have been Paul. But I never hear the name of Paul in there. And I often wondered why. He talked uh, Timothy and some of the other names that you hear come out. But I never hear the name of Paul. And he wrote half of our New Testament Bible. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Why, why wouldn't they put his name in there that they want to see when they get to heaven? Do they think that maybe they got an underlying thought that he's not going to be there? Or is it because he told us how to live a Christian life? He told us how not to be a hypocrite, didn't he? Verse 2, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You're going to church and you're living in sin. How is this possible? According to the word of God, how shall we who are dead to sin keep living in sin? Do you not know, he says in verse 3, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. How is it they're not walking in newness of life? They're breaking God's commandments every week by going to church on Sunday. Breaking God's commandment when he said the seventh day was the Sabbath. Every week that goes by, they're doing that. And they're not looking to do anything else. They're continuing to break God's commandment. And so they're living in sin, aren't they? And yet to have this premise that it's going to be all okay. <coughs> Maybe Adam and Eve thought it was going to be all okay too. When God said not to eat of that forbidden fruit. I mean, we ate it. Now it was done with and over with now. That's behind us. Let's move on. Let's do something else, God. Verse 5 says, For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth, we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. And so if you are dead in Christ, then you're freed from this sinful way of living. Now, a couple weeks ago, or a few weeks ago, I showed you that Paul, just like all the Christians in his day and in Jesus' day, was going into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Most people would agree that people are looking for the easy way out. Well, that's when everybody goes to churches on Sunday. Or maybe they'll be passing out food stamps for us so I don't have to plant a garden. Huh. <laughs> See, they're looking for the easy way out. They're not looking to do Don't eat of that fruit because the day you eat of it, you're going to die. That's what God told Adam and Eve. Did God back it up? Has every child of Adam and Eve died? Are we also not going to die as well? In both the business world and in our personal lives, people cut corners. 
why they want to obtain faster results. Some people steal because they're in a hurry to get some wealth and they don't want to wait around and they definitely don't want to have to work for it, so they're stealing. In our society, we've taken the fast food mentality in our lives and now they have drug it into the churches. I don't want to work. I don't want to have to cook. I want my food right now, though. <laughs> you see? I don't want to have to be good. I don't want to have to not sin. But I want to go to heaven right now. Isn't that their mentality? <laughs> Is God going to let these people into his heaven that are breaking his holy commandments? He said, honor the Lord, honor the Sabbath, and keep it holy. What corners are people willing to cut in order to obtain this quick and easy salvation? So they think. Rather than reading the Bible and acting on the commands of God, they're opting for the easier way out. A method that is being used by probably billions, but at least millions of people in an effort to perceive what they think is salvation. Are they really being saved? Or are they being fooled into thinking they're being saved? People seem like I don't know, it just seems like people want to have an easier way out. In John chapter 10, and verse 1, Jesus speaking, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. So these people that are breaking God's Sabbath, Jesus says they're thieves and robbers because they're trying to get in some other way. He calls them thieves and robbers. Now, I broke the Sabbath for lots of years. I've done a lot of bad things in my life, and I'm not proud of them. And if God judged me, for all the things that I had done back then, I'd probably be burning in hell myself right now. But thanks be to God that he kept me alive long enough to see the light and that I should do the right thing. And I could search after God and seek after what he wanted me to do. So when you stand before him to be judged, is he gonna judge you as a thief and a robber? trying to get in some other way? The idea is simply pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart and you'll be saved from your sin, huh? But that's not in the Bible, is it? That's something else they came up with. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you. And this teaching is, well, it's everywhere. But it's in complete odds with what the Bible has to say. In fact, I've heard numerous sermons and books and tracts out there about this. And it's not uncommon to hear or read something referred to as a sinner's prayer. A sinner's prayer. See, oh, live like hell. Then pick up this little paper here and read it. It's called a sinner's prayer. Did you read it? Well, you're saved then. Go ahead and continue doing what you was doing. And if God wants you to change, he'll change you. <coughs> Don't that sound good? That's the easy way out. But it's not true. We have to do something. We have to do the right thing. We have to do what God says to do. And so, 
those who embrace this quick and easy method, they'll tell you something like this, accept Christ into your heart through prayer and he'll receive you. It doesn't matter what church you belong to or if you do good work. You'll be born again at the moment you ask Jesus to come into your heart. He's at the door knocking right now. Just trust Christ as your Savior. God loves you and forgives you unconditionally. Anyone out there in this church this morning can be saved if they ask Jesus to come into their heart right now. Let us pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask yourself this morning. Anybody that's been listening to my messages over the years, have you ever heard me say something like that? Have you ever heard me even get close to something like that? Their prayer sometimes sounds like, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. <coughs> Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. Now I want to ask you something. Has anybody ever read that in the Bible? Have you ever even seen any kind of teaching in the Bible that goes along with what I just read here? Where does the Bible tell you that in order to be saved, you should pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart? I do not find a single biblical reference to doing such. Through all my studies in the Bible, it is not found. And many people, like myself years ago, I heard it from someone else, and I used it. I said the same thing. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, I said the same thing. As I began to study the Word of God, I thought, why am I saying something like that? I can't find no reference to it anywhere in the Bible. Why would I do that? Because it sounds good. But does it help anybody? Does it get you saved? Does it change you from a vow sinner into a born-again Christian? Or does it give you a good feeling? So I was wrong, and I was in denial. And so many of these new converts who pray their prayer fall away from God. <coughs> and many that have gone to this church right here. It's sad to say, but you see how some of them are living right now. And we see how some of them went back to living when they left the church. And one has to wonder, how is it that God lets these kind of people into his heaven? I think the answer is clear. He doesn't. Romans chapter 1, verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. We have to do something. Romans chapter 16, verse 26. But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. You've got to obey God. You've got to do what God says to do. And God said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thy heart, thou shalt be saved. Isn't that something? 
That's nowhere close to asking Jesus to come into your heart, though, is it? <laughs> and so why, why say something that's not true? Because it's a feel-good feeling? Because it gets people to come back to church? And gets people to live like ever how they want to live, I guess. Not be in obedience to the scripture. If the truth be seen, the sinner can pray for salvation as long and as hard as he wants. But that prayer alone is not going to result in him getting saved. And that alone cannot be accomplished. Getting saved alone cannot be accomplished just because somebody said a prayer. And to say to God to send Jesus into your heart, we know that God here is not sinners. <laughs> so, isn't that what John 9 31 said? We know God here is not sinners. So, when you say, God send Jesus into my heart, is He going to hear that prayer? Think about that for a minute. Is God going to hear that sinner's prayer? Send Jesus into my heart. The Bible plainly says he's not. God will not respond to such a request. And so salvation, that person didn't get saved. Now he may be started to go into church, tithing, and thinking he's a pretty good person. And there may have been some changes in him and in his life. But did he get saved? Is he keeping God's commandments? See, that's the, that's the crux of the whole thing. When you get saved, you want to keep God's commandments. When you want to be churchy, well, see, you do churchy things then, don't you? You don't get saved, you do churchy things. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Each of the different denominations say what you must do to be saved. But I don't see any of them being right. Seventh-day Adventists keep the Sabbath. But they got a prophetess, female out there, which the Bible plainly states a woman's not supposed to be preaching. And so, with this Ellen G. White, if they're doing everything this woman's telling them to do, they're doing everything that God says not to do. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse, read it, 35. Many new denominations hold on to their old denomination practices, I guess you could say, even if they don't fully understand why they're doing what they're doing. And people, or pastors, I've seen pastors pressure people into getting saved. Church of God, when we was a member of the Church of God out of Beckley, West Virginia, sent us letters up here saying people that did not have the gift of tongues were not saved. And we had to get out there and make these people have the gift of tongues to get them saved. The Bible doesn't say that. <coughs> the Bible says if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thine heart then thou shalt be saved the Bible also says in the book of Acts what must I do to be saved believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved you say nothing about the gift of tongues being saved we had a major controversy with these people 
And through it all, the whole church seen what they were doing. Oh yeah, we did have people here that spoke in tongues at the time. And we still have people that, here in this church that speak in tongues. But does that mean they're saved? <laughs> I've seen a woman right here in this church prophesy, speaking in tongues, and going out the door, she had a telephone stuck up to her ear, talking to someone on the other end of the line, cursing that her with some lot of vile curse words before she ever went through that back door back there. How could she be saved in doing that kind of stuff in church? If someone wanted people to think they were saved, then they would shout out some kind of whatever. And that particular pastor at that church, I guess, would proclaim that person as being saved and full of the Spirit of God. <laughs> but when I got to thinking about it, I wrote him a letter at that church uh, down there in Beckley. I told him I thought they was full of something, but I didn't think it was the Spirit of God. Needless to say, they didn't like that. They got a thing with the, that denomination. They want to stir up their members into a frenzied state so they can prove that they are saved. I can tell you one thing. I preached some messages at this church. I laid hands on people right in this building right here that I'm speaking to you in today. And at the time we had quite a few people come. And one, one night I preached a message. I don't even remember what. But I laid hands on people and they instantly fell over backwards onto the floor. And when I came back up to the podium up here, everywhere you looked in this church, there was people laying flat on the floor. Over 20 probably at one time. They said they were slain in the spirit. Where are they at now? Where are they at this morning? I know some of them died without the Lord. I know some of them stayed here and died with the Lord. And they're with the Lord in heaven now. And we know where the others who aren't with the Lord are at. They're in hell. So my question is, can they be slain in the spirit and be saved and go to hell? Would God do something like that? People here call that a move of the Spirit. It was never my objective to see all these people lying on the floor. I was sent here to preach the Word. God said, I want you to go out there to Pine Grove, West Virginia for the saving of families. He didn't tell me to go out there and slay people in the spirit. How did that happen? Being slain in the spirit is not wrong. But if a person is doing it, and that person is not real in what he's doing with God, you know that person and God knows it. And they're going to be standing in front of God one day. And God's going to say, what were you doing in that church laying on the floor like you were slain in the spirit? I read some books later on after that. And science says it's an influence of self-hypnotism. I don't know. It's self-something, I can tell you that. 
But it's sad that Christianity is compelled to hear that some people were doing it for show and they were not moved by the Holy Spirit. But many of these worldly churches have felt it necessary to do this, to get people moved or something. I don't know. I preach the gospel to the people and all those that were willing were called to be baptized. And this is a public profession of what your faith is when you're baptized. I don't know. I baptized a lot of people here. In this baptistry behind us, out here in the creek, in several places up and down this creek. But I never baptized anybody that didn't claim to have Jesus, that didn't claim to be saved. But some people thought being baptized was a way to get Jesus to come into their hearts. Now, Billy Graham <laughs> played a major role in this evolution of the sinner's prayer. Following an altar call, individuals who responded at his whatever were told to pray and accept Christ as their Savior. And after a while, he had a Bible printed. And he had this written on the pages of God's Holy Word. So you could say it was in the Bible. But it was like on the side. It wasn't in the words of God. It was kind of like on the side, like I write in my Bible sometimes on the side. John chapter 1, verse 11 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But have become the sons of God, even to them that which will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And so they retranslated this word. <laughs> even if only a few welcomed and received him. But to all who received come the children of God. All they had to do was just trust in him and he would save them. All those who believe this are reborn. Not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but from the will of God. And so, with their new Bible in hand, reading the verses like this, <coughs> this mandates a new plan of salvation. And the believers point to this verse that states, Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so does God respond to a sinner's prayer? Because the Bible just said all sinners simply to call upon the Lord and be saved. We just read that verse, Romans 10, 13. But regardless of what some teach about this verse, the fact is it instructs sinners to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. And when you call upon the name of the Lord salvation, is this the same thing as praying to Jesus to come into your heart? <laughs> you see? Isn't it just a, a, a thing how they've twisted God's word around to make it mean what they want it to mean? What sounds good to your ears? What brings you back with tithes in your hands? Calling on the Lord's name means you're appealing to his authority. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or doing, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions, affections, and lust. Every single act a Christian performs in word or deed should be carried out in Christ's authority. 
Think about that for a minute. Everything we do should be done in the name of Jesus. Receiving salvation is no different. In order to obtain salvation, we must submit to the Lord's authority. Whosoever therefore that shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. There's no question that God hears our prayers if we look at it in that light then, huh? God is omniscient and therefore hears and sees everything that transpires on the earth. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord? The writer of the book of Hebrews commented, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do with. So there is no doubt that God hears our prayers in a sense that he is aware of the petitioner and his or her prayer. So the question then becomes is, does God, dis does God respond to the prayer? You see, we know that God hears not sinners. Well, does God respond to your prayer? Does God honor the request made by someone who is not a Christian? Does God honor the request of a person claiming to be a Christian in the church, living in sin? Is God going to honor that person's prayer? Think about that. What does the Bible teach about God's response to the sinner? Well, we just read that God does not hear or respond to the prayer of the sinner. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 29, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. The New Testament puts it, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. You see, that's what it all gets down to. Are you worshiping God? Are you doing what God says? That means doing His will. Isn't that what it says? Doeth His will? He hears that person? Are you keeping God's holy Sabbath? Are you keeping God's commandments? Are you breaking every commandment? Do you expect God to hear your prayer this morning? I did not write this Bible. But I'm bringing out the verses in it to make people aware. I too have gone the wrong way many times in my life. And I'm not proud of it. God is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Isn't that what I just said? Well, look at Psalm 66. If I regard, verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. <laughs> well, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? If I regard iniquity. How do you regard iniquity in your heart? Think about that. Oh, I know to do the right thing, but I'm not doing it. I know I'm supposed to keep the Sabbath, but I ain't doing it. I know I ain't supposed to steal, but who's going to miss this little bit of something? You know, I know I'm not supposed to lie, but who's going to know? If I say this and I say that, who's going to back it up and say so-and-so this and so-and-so that? The psalmist also wrote in Psalm 34, verse 15, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Verse 16, The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. And then Isaiah speaks out, and he says, in Isaiah 59 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But what? Verse 2, Marie. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, 
And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. You see, how can you be a Christian and be a sinner at the same time? Do you want God to hear your prayer? Have you been born again? See, a lot of people think they have, when in fact they haven't. They've done what some man in the world told them to do. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus gives us an example. Verse 9. He spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and they despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift his eyes unto heaven, but smoting his breast, saying, Lord, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You know, it's a humbling thing for someone to tell you you've been doing something wrong and you need to start doing it right. Have you humbled yourself to do what God says to do? That humbles a person. Oh, I ain't doing that. I'm not. I'm, no, I'm going to church on Sunday. I'm not going on Saturday. I've been doing this Sunday thing my whole life, and all my family, my mama, my grandmama, my granddaddy, as far back as I can remember, they've been going to church on Sunday. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other men. Is that what you're saying? Christ explained that it was the publican, not the Pharisee, that went away justified. It's knowing you have sinned and you need to make it right with God. You've got to do the right thing. You've come to the conclusion that I'm being religious, I'm being churchy, I'm being Christianized or whatever. You need to come to the realization as to what God's Word has to say. Under the Old Covenant, this man was a child of God, this publican. Yes, he was a child that was living in sin, but he was still one of God's children. God help us. How many of God's children are going to have their names blotted out of the book of life because they refused to do what God said? Went through all that, lived their lives, went to church, and then end up getting their names blotted out of the book of life. This publican did not pray to God for salvation. He prayed for forgiveness. God forgive me, I'm a sinner. Do you see that? He didn't over impress upon God like, you got to do it anyway, God. You know me. <laughs> you know? And we look at this and people use this as a sinner's prayer. doesn't justify it doesn't it doesn't oh we can't pray the sinner's prayer like this and do this look at Cornelius in the Bible Acts chapter 10 verse 3 it says he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him Cornelius and when he looked upon him, he said what is for God now look at that was praying here, wasn't he? 
And God did hear his prayer. Isn't that what the Bible says? God heard his prayer. As the angel said on the Lord's behalf. Thy alms are going up for a memorial before God. That's what he says. And so, was Cornelius a sinner when God heard his prayer? Think about that. Look at the words you, uh, that Luke used to describe Cornelius. Acts chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. This is the kind of man Cornelius was. He was always praying. He was a devout man. He was a good man. Now, how could he be a sinner as well? Acts chapter 10, verse 21. <laughs> Boy, it really gets deep here, don't it? Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you see. What is the cause wherefore you are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that fears God and of good report among all the nation of Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and hear the words of thee. <laughs> why, why was he afraid? If he was saved, why was he afraid? You see, he was a devout man. He prayed to God all the time, but was he saved? There's a difference, church. If you've been in church your whole life, there's still a difference. The picture comes clear now. A sincere, godly, devout, righteous acting man. And does the scriptures refer to a sinner as devout and righteous? So, he was living under the old law. He was living under Judaism. He was neither a Jew, nor was he a proselyte of some Jewish religion, because he was an uncircumcised Gentile. And so, from the very time of Adam and Eve down to now, this man was living under God's law. And as much as Cornelius was neither a Jew nor a proselyte, he was worshiping God under the patriarchal system from the very beginning. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father." And so they was praying their way under the patriarchal system, and we praying to God through Jesus. And God warned him, you need to get saved. You need to hear the word that this man's preaching. You need to get saved under the new system. Because that system's rapidly closing down. But the attitude towards the Jews and the Gentiles, well, they was having a problem. And so we see, we see in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. <laughs> and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. Why are you waiting around? It's time for you to do the right thing. Get up. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. As the scripture has said. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth 
and shalt believe in thine heart, thou shalt be saved. And then go out and get yourself baptized. This is the way to be saved. Cornelius' prayer, therefore, was not a prayer of a sinner, but one of a man living righteously under the patriarchal law. Ephesians 2, verse 12. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He did not imply that they were in a position because they were Gentiles, but because they were Gentiles who had not been obedient to the particular law they had been given. And so God answers why in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. You see, I've been preaching out here now 15 years. And God said to me one day, I'm not going to wink at your sin any longer. You need to keep my holy Sabbath if you plan on coming to my heaven. God told me plainly, this world is not going to be here much longer. And I need someone to stand up. And I'm calling men everywhere. And I'm telling men everywhere. They need to repent. For now is the end time. Now is the day of salvation. First Peter chapter 3 verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Will God respond to the prayers of a sinner for forgiveness? Think about it. Will God answer a sinner's prayer? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Romans 10, 9, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth Confession is made unto salvation. This is the way to be saved, church. It ain't no other way. There ain't no saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Ain't no baptism going to save you. Ain't no preacher going to save you. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. So what are we looking at this morning, church? Are you saved? Are you ready to enter into God's heaven? Forgiveness is only available in Christ. If any man is, a new, is in Christ, he's a new creation. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, For we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of us that have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, to be in Christ, a person has to have believed the gospel, have repented, and confessed faith in Christ, and then been baptized. Prayer does not put one into Christ. One becomes a member of the family of God by being born again. That's what Jesus said. Nicodemus, John chapter 3, verse 3. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The sinner's prayer ain't going to save you, church. You've got to be born again. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The new birth is being saved, and it is obtained by being born again, by water and of the Spirit. In James chapter 4, verse 3, You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. 
that you may consume it upon your lust. In Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. I can go on and on and on this morning, you know, The angel of the Lord, Acts chapter 8, verse 26, was speaking to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. I want to say, Go out into the desert. So he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, it came to Jerusalem to worship. Here's a eunuch from Ethiopia that come to Jerusalem to worship God. He was returning and sitting on his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. The spirit said, Philip, go near and join thyself to the chariot. And Philip ran over to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, How can I? except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place that he read in the scripture, he was as sheep, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation and his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare this generation? So the eunuch asked Philip, he says in verse 34, who's he talking about? Who's the prophet talking about, himself or some other man? And Philip opened his mouth. And he began to explain to him Jesus. <laughs> and as he, as he went, he believed on Jesus, is what happened here. He believed on Jesus. And they come to the water, and the eunuch says, See, here's water. What does it hinder me to be baptized? What does Philip say, verse 37, Marie? I'm not in the right place. Acts 1. Chapter 8. Okay. And verse 37. And Philip said, Okay. And Philip said, Thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You see, it's not asking Jesus into your heart, it's believing. What's so hard about that? You believe some man. Why don't you believe God? What's so hard about believing the Word of God? He said he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And they were come up out of the water, and the spirit caught Philip away that the eunuch saw him no more. But he went away rejoicing because he was saved. Final verse this morning, Matthew chapter 5, please. We look at the Beatitudes as Jesus was speaking. He went up into a mountain, and when he had set, the Bible says, his disciples came unto him, in verse 1. Now look at verse 5. He said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But verse 6 says what, Marie? Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Or have you best been churchianized? Christianized? We need to be born again. Are you ready to accept Jesus as your Savior this morning? You have to confess with your mouth 
And you have to believe in your heart. And you can be saved this morning. And you can believe that God will hear your prayer. But once you become a born-again Christian, you want to do what God wants you to do. It's not about what your pastor has to say. It's not about what your mama, your daddy, your grandmama, whoever has to say. It's about what God has to say. If you become a born-again Christian, you want to do what God says. That's all. Do what God says. Nothing less. Only more of what God has to say. So this morning I ask you, we're going to have an altar call here. Are you ready to do what God says? Or do you want to continue on like you've been? There's only one way to heaven, and Jesus Christ is that way. If you've got loved ones who have died and gone on to heaven, I hope they made it there. If they didn't, do you want to go to the hell they're in? You see, it's going to be between you and God when you get to your judgment. It's not going to be between you and your loved one. Oh yeah, you're going to know them. If they made it in and you make it in, yeah, you're going to get to see them again. But if they didn't make it, do you want to go to hell with them? Think about that. <coughs> so I asked you this morning, consider where you're at. <coughs> but first off, consider where you're going. <coughs> you can change your destination this morning. You can make heaven your home. And you can know these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. Like 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. You may know that you have eternal life when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You can know you're saved. Thank you. Amen.